good afternoon again, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Tammy Welty. I'm the Director of Training and Communications here at Bradford & Barthel. We have Alec Bradford and Nicholas Ward leading today's Supplemental Job Displacement Benefits webinar. Uh, this topic is being offered due to your request, so thank you so much for your topic suggestions. We really appreciate them. How about we meet Alec and Nick? Alec, do you want to go first? Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Alec Bradford. I am the managing partner of the San Diego office of Bradford and Barthel. Uh, I do ADR. I do large loss. I do uh, some training, some other things. Uh, and yeah, I'm here if you have any questions, you ever need to reach out for anything about San Diego or any of the other areas that I work on. Uh, and yeah, I have two kids. I have a two-year-old son and a six-year-old daughter. So life is pretty hectic right now. Uh, let's go ahead and pass it on to Nick. Good afternoon, everyone. For those who don't know me, my name is Nicholas Ward. I am also out of the San Diego office. I have been with Bradford and Barthel for almost eight years now. I've been a partner for two years. Um, I am a part of the COVID team as well. If you can see the screen in front of you right there, you have the COVID um, email if you have any questions about that COVID. It's a little different now starting this year, so it's a little bit. So if you have any questions or issues on that, reach out to me. Um, I don't have two kids. I only have one. My wife and I just had a kid, a son. He turns one in a week and a half, which is the craziest thing ever. And he just took his first steps yesterday. So the house is nowhere near prepared for the <laughs> chaos that's about to happen. We are way behind, but it's very exciting happening, um, things happening in the house right now. Awesome. Yeah. So with that, we can move on into the exciting topic today of the Supplemental Job Displacement Benefits, aka the voucher. And before we get into it, let's kind of go over the definition and kind of what it actually means. So per Labor Code Section 4658.7, if the injury causes permanent partial disability, the injured employee shall be entitled to a supplemental job displacement benefit unless the employer makes an offer of modified, regular, or alternative work. Now, this labor code section applies to injuries occurring on January 1st, 2013, or injuries occurring afterwards. If you have any injuries or cases um, that are pre-2013, I will say a prayer for you after this presentation. Um, but this presentation will mainly focus on injuries dated January 1st, 2013, moving forward. If you have specific questions for any injuries before that, shoot me an email. We have the emails on the previous slide from myself and Alec. You can provide us with uh, your question and about that specific case. So moving forward with exactly what the voucher is. So again, a voucher would be entitled unless an offer was made. So this offer has to be made no later than 60 days after receipt of a permanent and stationary report from the PTP, AME, or QME, and that the report found that the injury has caused some permanent partial disability. The offer is for regular work, modified work, or alternative work lasting at least 12 months. Now, to break down exactly what regular work means, what modified work means, alternative work, um, they do provide some definitions. So for regular work, this means that the employee's usual occupation or the position in which the employee was engaged at the time of injury and that offers wages and compensation equivalent to those paid to the employee at the time of injury and it's located within a reasonable commuting distance from the applicant's residence at the time of injury. Essentially, this just means that the applicant's going back to exactly the same work he or she was performing um, at the time of the injury. Now, modified work means regular work modified so that the employee has the ability to perform all the functions of the job and that offers wages and compensation that are at least 85% of those paid to the employee at the time of injury. And again, this must be located within a reasonable commuting distance of the applicant's residence. This just means modified duties, you know, can't lift above the shoulder, uh, no pushing, pulling greater than 10 pounds, you know, all the typical modified duties you see within medical reports. This just means you're providing a job that is able to accommodate those um, restrictions. And the last one, alternative work. This means that the employee has the ability to perform and that offers 
wages and compensation that are at least 85% of those paid to the employee at the time of the injury. And again, this must be located within a reasonable commute of the applicant's residence. This if the applicant was able to perform job A, but now is no longer able to perform that, even with modified duties, you're able to provide and offer job B with the 85% of the compensation. Usually this is sedentary work or something they're no longer able to stand and things like that. Now, when we hear the word reasonable, you know, with regards to the distance, you know, the WCB never understands what reasonable means. So they kind of break it down with a case by case basis. Um, and you have to determine whether the new location is a reasonable distance from the applicant's residence. However, the reasonable distance uh, at the time of injury may be waived by the employee. The condition shall be deemed to be waived if the employee accepts the regular work, modified work, or alternative work, and does not object to the location within 20 days of being informed the right to object. So say they're working at one location and then you give a, a job offer for another location, they have 20 days to object to that new location after providing them with the um, information that they are able to object. Now again, we'll go through this part a little bit quickly because it's pre-January 1st, 2013. Again, if you have any claims or issues with these types of cases, please email us and we can address them on a separate basis. But for dates of injuries from January 1st, 2004, I hope nobody has one around there, to December 31st, 2012, if the total PD was less than 15%, you would get 4,000. If you have PD from 15 to 25%, the voucher would be 6,000. 26% to 49%, you get 8,000. And then 50% to 99%, you'd get 10,000. And then the WCAB realized that nobody in workers' comp likes to do math, so they def decided to get rid of that immediately. So then that's when, starting on January 1st, 2013, the supplemental job displacement benefit shall be in the form of a voucher redeemable as provided in this section up to an aggregate of $6,000. Now, the supplemental job displacement uh, benefit shall be offered to the employee within 20 days after the expiration of the time for making an offer of regular modified or alternative work. So when you got that PNS report, you had 60 days to make an offer. If that did not take place, then you have 20 days after that to offer the voucher. Um, so it's about the 80 days. That's about the timeline for this whole voucher process is about those 80 days. In regards to the voucher expiring, the voucher shall expire two years after the date of the voucher is furnished to the employee or five years after the date of injury, whichever is later. The employee shall not be entitled to payment or reimbursement of any expenses that have not been incurred and submitted with appropriate documentation to the employer prior to the ex expiration date. So let's say you issued a voucher on January 1st, 2024. And then on come January 2nd, 2026, if the applicant provides you documentation to all these things saying, hey, I incurred all these expenses, this exposure, blah, 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 you can then make the argument that that is not redeemable due to the fact that the a voucher has expired. And he, the next slide is just kind of going over some examples what the voucher pays for. So I'll give a little bit more in depth about what um, the voucher can be redeemed for. One of them is payment for education related retraining or skill enhancement or both at a California public school or with a provider that is certified and on the state's eligible tra training provider list. This includes payment of tuition fees, books, and other expenses required by the school for retraining or skill enhancement. Also payment for the occupational licensing or professional certification fees related to the examination fees and examination preparation course fees. Payment for the services of licensed placement agencies, vocational or return to work counseling, resume preparation, and, and this is all combined up to 10% of the voucher. Purchase of tools required by training or educational program in which the employee is enrolled. And also purchase of computer equipment, which could go up to $1,000. The last one's kind of a catch-all. It's up to $500 as a miscellaneous expense reimbursement or advance payable upon request and without the need for itemized documentation or accounting. 
The employee shall not be entitled to any other voucher payment for transportation, travel expenses, telephone or internet access, clothing, uniforms, or any incidental expenses. So again, that's kind of a lot. Um, if you have some interesting claims where the applicant is maybe making a claim for reimbursement for a certain uh, payment, and it's not one of these on the list, email us and we can kind of go over to see if that would be something that would fall under the voucher reimbursement. And for the voucher and for all things kind of associated with it, there are a few forms. Again, pre-January 1st, 2013, uh, there was an older form that's no longer used. Again, if you have a in case from that date, you know, we can kind of go over it. But um, this new form is a form that is provided to doctors and um, PTPs, a QMEs, AMEs. And what it is is just is the form 101 33.33. This is just a very template form kind of going over what the applicant's job duties are. And in regards to the Fair Employment and Housing Act, this requires that the employers conduct an interactive process before industrially injured workers may be terminated. This is kind of along the lines of like a 132A situation and issue. What the Fair Employment and Housing Act is requiring here that if an applicant is hurt at work, they're trying to avoid being terminated for that reason. So you must do some due diligence and do some due process on the part where you need to look to see if you can provide an offer of work to the applicant before terminating them. So again, so they're just trying to really protect the applicant and to kind of make sure that if there is work available for the applicant, that the employer provides that with prior to just terminating. And this next one is kind of something that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. It's the physician's return to work and voucher report. Again, another beautiful form. Um, there's about two or three forms total for uh, the voucher. This one is a little different than before. And this section is a little different than the labor code section 4658.7 which dealt with a PNS report. This doesn't necessarily mean you need a MMI report. This is something that is provided to the doctor. They fill it out and provide it, pretty much going over exactly what the job duties are and what work restrictions are with that. So when you get this report in form filled out and returned by the doctor, you, the offer, you again, just like before, you have to make an offer of regular, modified, or alternative work must be made within 60 days after receipt by the claims administrator of this form. And again, the work must be lasting at least 12 months, just like before. So it's pretty much very similar to before, but now you might not necessarily have a PNS report and which would could possibly trigger the need for the voucher. So again, so now this is now dealing now if we've determined that no offer was made within 60 days um, and now we're in the when you have to provide the voucher to the applicant. Again, earlier you had to make that offer within 20 days. You also have to send the voucher. So if no, uh, so per rule 10133.33c, if no offer for regular modified or alternative work is made pursuant to the above the, the previous labor code sections that we've already discussed, the claims administrator shall furnish a supplemental job displacement non-transferable vouchers for injuries occurring on or after January 1st, 2023. Now this form is 10133.32. I know that's long, but I'm sure we've most of us have dealt with the form. And if you don't have a copy of these forms or know what they look like, again, you can email me and I have a copy of all the forms that I could show you. So this must be provided within 20 calendar days from expiration of the time for making an offer of regular, modified, or alternative work. And again, the, the job must be lasting um, 12 months. Now within 20 days after the 60 day period or with 10 days of knowledge. So this also can apply to if the, we knew that the employer would no longer be able to make an offer you don't have to wait all the days. You could then just send the voucher. Um, again, this must be sent by this. You must send the voucher via certified mail. This is just to confirm that it was sent, you know, and almost like a proof of service. And if you have any questions on when to send it or anything like that, let us know. Now, 
there's not technically any exceptions to the provision of the voucher, but there are some ways where a voucher would not be owed. Um, Labor Code Section 4658.7 does not provide any exceptions to the provision of the voucher when the employer does not timely make an offer of work. But per Rule 10133.31c, an employee who has lost no time from work or has returned to the same job for the same employer, that's very important, is deemed to have been offered and accepted regular work in accordance with the criteria set forth in Labor Code Section 46758.7. This provision was added to clarify that if an applicant loses no time from work or returns to his or her regular job, no return to work offer is required. I don't normally recommend this on the defense. You know, we always need as much protection as possible and never want to leave it up to the WCAB to determine if we did something proper or not. I always recommend, even if they did return to work and they're working the full duties to provide the offer in writing, just so we have everything in writing and can protect us as much as possible. But that is an employer is not required to provide a voucher. If the applicant has lost no time from work as a return to work for the same employer, just because it fails to make an offer on the appropriate form of regular modified or alternative work. Again, the rule does protect you for this, but again, I always am under the impression that you want as much defense as possible. So I always recommend making it in writing something. It doesn't have to be exactly on the other forms that we talked about, but something in writing where parties sign always protects you a little bit more than just if it comes down to a he said, she said battle. Now the next two slides, I don't think too many people have claims referring um, regarding these issues. However, it does come up and there is some case law on it. Um, if you have a uh, particular claim that it involves these, uh, this very specific issue, again, shoot us an email and we could talk about the one because it's just, you don't see it too often. So there are two cases that deal with when an offer to work to an employee who may not return to work lawfully. So in Del Taco versus the WCAB and Salas versus Sierra Chemical Company, um, the court held that no voucher was owed to an illegal immigrant when the applicant cannot return to work solely due to the immigration issues. And when you hear the word solely, that's when you really have to focus. And there's not too much case law in this situation. So if, there, if you have an applicant that solely cannot return to work solely due to the immigration status issues, then you can um, make the argument that no voucher is owed. Yeah, and there's there's a policy reason for that. They're essentially uh, committing an illegal act if they're aware the applicant's not legally able to work. And so they are not legally able to offer the job. Uh, so that's a pretty specific situation, but it does come up. Thank you. So again, here, this the next slide is just a Salas versus Sierra Chemical Company. We kind of just went over exactly what it is. Um, I'm hoping in the future we can get a little bit more case on this so we can kind of fully understand what it means. Um, but at this moment, yeah, if it's solely due to the immigration status, then you know you have the argument for not issuing the voucher. And then the next few slides are the interesting ones kind of Again, not exceptions to issuing a voucher, but reasons why a voucher may not be owed. So when would an offer of work to an employee who cannot return to work? Sometimes an employee is unable to offer an applicant work following an industrial injury for reasons unrelated to that injury. Again, the most common reason here is that they're terminated for cause. So what happens when an applicant is terminated for cause and can no longer provide that offer uh, to return to work Initial case law was in the defense's favor, and then we have a case I'll go over that kind of really opened the bag to exposure for the employer, even if the applicant was terminated. So in one case, the board held that an applicant was not entitled to a voucher when he was terminated for cause, as you can see, he was threatening violence to a coworker while on modified duties. The board found no case law indicating that an employer must rehire an employee who was terminated for cause, or on the alternative, provide a supplemental job displacement benefits to such an employee. So at first, we were off to a great start. Looks like if there's a termination for cause, then no voucher would be owed. <clears throat> Even if no, uh, no offer 
of work for regular modified alternative work was ever offered. However, in Dennis versus the state of California, um, this the WC held that a former straight state prison inmate was entitled to the voucher when the state of California could not make a bona fide offer of work. And the term right there, bona fide offer of work, will be crucial. So I'll go over this, and then I'll kind of go over some of the case law that's followed this Dennis claim and kind of where we're at today. Moving forward, hopefully we can get some more case law and kind of maybe something that combat the Dennis case. But right now, this one seems to be the one that's holding all the weight. So the applicant in the Dennis case suffered an admitted injuries while performing construction work as an inmate. The defendant sent her notice of offer of regular modified alternative work, but at the same time sent a letter indicating that the applicant was not eligible for employment because she was released from prison. The applicant inquired about the job offer, but was informed that the position was not available because she was no longer an inmate. The board determined that the defendant made an illusion of a job offer rather than a bona fide, bona fide job offer. So here, applicants in prison had a job, was released from prison. The defense offered that same job, but with that indicated that you can no longer work here because you're no longer an inmate. And the board held that because you had those two letters that kind of contradicted each other, that this was an illusion of a job offer rather than a bona fide, bona fide job offer. So kind of moving forward from that, from the WCB and from this Dennis case, the employer generally has the burden of offering modified alternative work within the employee's work restrictions to avoid viability for the voucher. The board explained that pursuant to this Dennis claim, it is the offer of regular modified alternative work that releases an employer from providing the voucher. It is explained that there are no legal support for the notion that the impossibility of returning to work releases an employer from its statutory obligation to provide a voucher which is crazy. Um, so as it stands right now, the only thing that can get you to remove from, um, there are a few other exceptions, but at the moment, per the Dennis case, the only thing that can remove the employer from owing the voucher is the offer of regular modified or alternative work. <clears throat> and similarly, in another case, the appeals board held that an applicant was entitled to a voucher, even though she resigned from her employment with the defendant before she was declared permanent and stationary. The, WCB, the WCAB concluded that consistent with the holding in Dennis, the applicant's resignation from her employment did not preclude her entitlement to a voucher as long as she met the statutory requirements, namely a finding that she was permanently disabled and failed to receive an offer of regular modified alternative work. The appeals board also held that an employee's termination for cause did not bar his entitlement to a voucher. In one case, after the applicant was declared permanent and stationary, the employer terminated him following um, some investigation regarding sexual harassment behavior. The board held that pursuant to Dennis, absent a bona fide offer of regular modified alternative work, regardless of an employer's ability to make such an offer and regardless of the employee's ability to accept such an offer, an employee is entitled to the voucher. So as you can see here, if the applicant can meet the criteria, which means, you know, they were never provided that uh, regular modified or alternative work, and there is some permanent partial disability, regardless of whether the applicant can perform the job or is unable to perform, terminated, resigned, the burden still rel relies with the defense in regards to offering um, and issuing the voucher. Oh, I didn't mean, let me just say it back right here real quick. So... In the beginning, it seemed like when there was a termination for cause that no voucher would be owed because it wasn't the employer's responsibility to rehire an applicant after the termination. However, with the dentist claim, they really opened the door and almost made it 100% on the employer to make that offer regardless of the employment status of that applicant. We hoping for some new case law to come out Hopefully soon, sooner rather than later, but we know how slow workers' comp moves. So as of this moment, it seems like Dennis, the Dennis claim is the one that's holding the weight. Now, moving forward to seasonal employees, which is very popular 
for field workers, things like that. If they're working the summer jobs or things like that, um, they kind of have the rules are pretty much the same. Just there's a little bit of a difference compared to um, what we've already talked about today. So per rule 10133.34B4, this establishes the requirements for an offer of regular modified alternative work for a seasonal worker. Seasonal work means employment as a daily hire, a project hire, or an annual season hire. The offer, the job offer, must reflect the following. That the employee was hired for a seasonal work prior to the injury, so you can't have someone who was working full time and then you change up your offer to a seasonal. So prior to the injury, the applicant must have been a seasonal worker. The offer of regular modified alternative seasonal work is of reasonably comparable hours and working conditions to the employee's previous employment. And the one year requirement may be satisfied by cumulative periods of seasonal work. So obviously with the word seasonal employee, you know they're more than likely not working 12 months in a row. So what the WCAB held was that you don't need to then have them work 12 months in a row, but if they're working three months at a time, you have to make sure that there's at least four of those options for them. So they have three months, three months, three months, three months, and they're able to work, which then can then add up to the 12 months rule. The work must commence within 12 months of the date of offer. So again, with seasonal work, it might be the end of the season, so they might not be coming back to work for another eight, nine, 10 months. But the work must commence again within 12 months of the offer. And finally, the offer meets the other conditions re required for regular, modified, and alternative work, which we previously discussed um, above. This is so the last two slides. Well, this slide in particular gets a little confusing, um, a lot of back and forth, and sometimes it can get a little confusing on how you should resolve the voucher or if you're able to kind of settle out the voucher or what writing you should have in a compromise release um, pertaining to the voucher. As you know, that the compromise and release does have that one section where the parties can initial next to it and kind of settle out the voucher. The board usually will reject um, a CNR that has those initials barring certain facts. But let's kind of go over what this Beltron case does and kind of ways you can get around resolving the voucher and without having the um, settlement rejected or causing any delays in the claim. So per Labor Code Section 4658.7G and Rule 10133.31H, this precludes a settlement or commutation of a claim for the supplemental job displacement, um, job displacement benefit for injuries occurring on or after January 1st, 2023. So the benefit may be used only for the purposes outlined in the statute mentioned above. A workers' comp judge may decline to approve a settlement that impermissibly settles the voucher. So Beltron then kind of shed some light because, you know, rules are written and nobody knows what they mean. So you need the case, hopefully, can provide some sort of explanation and background to make it a little bit easier for everybody to understand. So in the Beltron case, the appeals board held that when the parties established there is a good faith dispute that if resolved against the applicant would defeat his or her entitlement to all workers' compensation benefits, he or she may settle a claim by compromise and release agreement that also settles the potential right to the sub supplemental job displacement benefit voucher. Usually this is about an AOE COE, case is fully denied, AOE COE, there is no medical or factual evidence to support an injury took place. However, you're at the depot, you wanna settle for five, 7,000, um, something around that range. You could, in this case, where if, um, when there's a good faith dispute that if resolved against the applicant would defeat their entitlement to benefits, then you're able to settle out the voucher with language within the CNR. Usually I put language to the, something to the likes of the defense is contesting the issuance of the voucher based on reasons A, B, C, something like that. Um, I always like to get a sentence in this uh, the settlement documents just to protect um, protect the defense. So in the Beltron case, the settlement agreement included an addendum indicating that the applicant was not entitled to the voucher because the defendant asserted that he suffered no injuries as a result of his employment and that he failed to report the injury prior to his, term prior to his termination. The WCAB, however, did not approve the release of the voucher. 
This was then, this case was then granted reconsideration and the board explained that an injured worker's entitlement to the voucher is conditioned on both the acceptance of liability for a claimed industrial injury by the employer and the existence of permanent partial disability or determination of those issues after trial. So again, if you have the AOE, COE issues, there's no PD or certain things like that, there are ways you could settle out the voucher. However, most cases don't have those things involved. So selling out the voucher is not allowed. Again, though, I usually like to put in language if the parties are contesting the voucher and you're able to have applicant's attorney agree to that. Again, I always put that language in there. You're not settling out the voucher, but the defendants contest the issuance of a voucher. So if the WCAB usually will accept that kind of language. And then if you have to go to trial on the voucher or something later in the future, you could do that, but always have that sentence or something like that in your settlement documents really kind of um, protects the protects the defense there. Uh, in a subsequent case, the appeals board held that the WCAB could issue a nuke pro tunk, which is a Latin term. I don't know why they use Latin all the time, but it means now for then, which I don't even, that doesn't make any sense either. But so what they held was that they could use this nuke pro tunk. And it, this refers to the ability of the court to go back and do something it meant to do in the first place, so long as it didn't materially change um, from the original action. So what the WCAB did in this claim, they issued an order amending an order approving compromise and release to comply with Beltron. The compromise and release reflected that there was a good faith dispute as to AOE COE, but the applicant, but the applicant sought the, but the WCB did not I apologize. So there was a good faith dispute in regards to AOE COE, but the WCAB did not make an express finding of that dispute in the order approving it. So then the applicant sought the supplemental job displacement benefit a month after the settlement, and then WM, the WCAB issued an amended order to include the finding that there was a good faith dispute existed in regards to AOE COE and that the defense was able to settle out the voucher. So again, when you have cases where you're settling via CNR early on, you know, you have the AOE COE dispute, there's a denial on the claim, always make sure you have some sort of sentence in there or make sure that when you get the order approving that they check that box on the order approving indicating that there is a dispute in regards to AOE COE. And that's why it's again, another, as I mentioned earlier, at the defense, we want as many things as possible as we can use to defend and, and argue our position. So make sure you have everything in there, make sure the order is proper. And again, the WCAB, as you can see, have allowed that they're allowed to do an amended order in order to reflect that, to make sure that the defense has everything they need to object to the issuance of the voucher. And again, this typically you see these situations with AOE, COE. Not too many cases do you get where QME and PTB find that there's no permanent disability. Those are far and few between, so you don't get that too often. So usually this will come up, Beltron and the settlement of the voucher and things of that nature will usually come up when there's an AOE, COE dispute. And my last slide for the day, and then I'll turn it over to Alec Bradford, is what happens, remember when we earlier we were addressing the, the physician's return to work and voucher form? What happens if the doctor, because doctors don't always provide those forms or sign those forms and return them, sometimes they're not provided to the doctor. Um, so what happens when there's a report, but there is no form? So in one case, the WCAB, the WCAB held that an applicant was entitled to a voucher, even though there was no evidence that a physician's return to work and voucher report was sent to or received by the defendant. However, in this case, it was undisputed that the defendant received a permanent and stationary report from the QME outlining work restrictions, but the QME just did not provide that physician's return to work form. The board explained that the defendant had the burden to obtain a physician's return to work form when it was appraised of the applicant's permanent disability status and the work conclusions in the CUME report. So essentially what this is saying is that when you get the MMI report, regardless if you get the return to work form with it, it's the defense's 
job to make sure, one, we contact the doctor, say, hey, where was that form? Can you provide it to me? Or two, if there is permanent disability and there's work restriction provided, that still starts the clock on whether um, the 60 days provide that offer. So if you're missing a form, things of that, but the QME report or PTP report provides the other information needed that you would know that a modified alternative or regular work offer would be needed, then it still starts the clock and you would still need to make sure that that offer is provided. And again, we can then also then talk to the QME P2P and say, hey, where was that return to work form and get that information. But just because that form was not present does not relieve the defense of the liability or the burden for the voucher or providing the offer. So those are my beginning slides. I'm, it, I'm now gonna turn it over to Alec Bradford and we can finish the rest of uh, the presentation. Hi everybody. So yeah, what happens then when I'm, I'm seeing a ton of questions regarding specific instances uh, as you can tell, the legislature, uh, Beltran, I believe, was a case law fix for a problem maybe the legislature didn't contemplate here. Uh, it seemed that they had this idea that it was either going to be a return to work or no. Uh, it would be relatively straightforward. Uh, but all sorts of specific instances are coming up uh, that weren't necessarily contemplated uh, when the voucher rules went into effect. So you have these situations where maybe somebody's terminated for cause, the dentist case says one thing, uh, something says something else. Maybe they retire and remove themselves from the job market prior to MMI. Uh, maybe they quit to take a higher paying job. Uh, one thing I would point out is the best rule of thumb is the minute you're on notice that there is permanent disability, uh, there are permanent modified duties, uh, it's really on the employer to to jump in, take a look at this, and it's on the carrier and the administrators to let the employer know that they should look at this and see if they have a spot offered for modified duty. So uh, there are some situations that have come from them in the questions uh, that you've had that are specific, and maybe a dispute's gonna arise from that. Uh, maybe you don't believe the voucher is owed, maybe the applicant does. Uh, so we have the dispute resolution process for that. Uh, the form is 10133.55, and that's going to be a request for dispute resolution before the administrative director. So what are the kinds of issues that are going to come up for that? It's going to be the employee's entitlement to a voucher. Obviously, that's the big one. Um, parties dispute the amount of the voucher. You're not going to see as often for uh, post-2013 cases. Uh, however, there may be uh, disputes about the amounts owed, and those seem to be more specific questions coming up a lot more often lately by the various parties involved in this voucher. Uh, applicant may be requesting one if they're claiming the insurer has failed to pay the training provider, or maybe the, the training provider wants to be paid, uh, or the employee objects to the job offer provided by the employer. Maybe, for instance, you've uh, been released from jail and the employer is claiming, well, you could always come back to jail. Um, there's some procedural considerations to take into effect here. Uh, you obviously want to include a summary of the informal efforts to resolve the dispute. And from the defense side, you're always going to want to consider documenting those efforts, right, from both the employer and the carrier. Um, you have 20 days to respond from the data of proof of service and the request. Uh, the ADs will then issue a determination within 30 days. Uh, if they don't get to it within 60 days, then the, uh, the uh, dispute is considered to be denied. Uh, either party may appeal that within 20 days by filing a petition in a DOR, and then you're going to be going down to the board to resolve this. Uh, audit penalties, these are important. You really want to make sure you're paying these vouchers out correctly and timely. Uh, rule 10111.2A27 is going to be what's involved here. And the penalty for each failure to comply with the, the voucher benefit notice requirements under 8 Cal Code Reg, section 10133.51 is $100 for each material incomplete or inaccurate notice 
or for each failure to send the notice of supplemental job displacement benefits by certified mail, uh, up to 500 for each failure to issue the notice um, of the benefits within 10 days of the last payment of TD, uh, up to $1,000 for each uh, failure to issue the voucher for uh, educated relating retraining and skill enhancement, and up to $1,000 for failure to pay any properly documented um, voucher billing within the timeframes requested. Uh, and we've had a lot of questions coming up about this lately, about the documentation, what is timely, what's not, um, what they're actually entitled to. So let's go over some of the basics of that. Uh, I am aware we're running a little bit short on time, so I'm going to do my best to get through what I can get through and hopefully answer a few questions at the end. Uh, so in summary, you got 4658.7 and rule 10133.33. Uh, you get the job duties. Uh, the maximum value is $6,000. That's going to be $500 for miscellaneous expense uh, related to uh, the, the voucher. Uh, physicians return to work and voucher report upon receipt. You got 60 days to make an offer. Uh, make sure you do that and put it on the form. Uh, otherwise, you, you may be able to argue if they return to work, if they never left work. There are certain situations. Uh, but I would I would argue best practice is always whether or not they've already been returned to work. Put it on the form. Do it timely. Comply with the letter of the law. Um, Vouchers due 20 days after the 60-day period or within 10 days of knowledge from the employer that no offer of work will be made. Uh, and once again, send a new copy of the notice. Uh, just always make sure you're better off documenting and notifying. Uh, so what is the documentation that we're going to be looking at for that? Uh, you're going to want to confirm the school course and program are approved, not just in general in the subject language. I did see one of the questions that came up was, can you just take this to any public school? Uh, and for that, they still have to be able to provide the training, right? You can't just show up with a voucher and hand it in if they don't have a curriculum set up for the voucher. So for that, you can look at the eligibility lists. Uh, the links are up there. Uh, there's quite a bit the counselor actually has to submit, and this is certainly coming up a lot recently with the indictments. Uh, the financial interest waiver has to be signed by the counselor in the school. Uh, the code sections provided up there. Uh, if there is a financial interest, it has to be disclosed, and clearly we have concerns right now about kickback violations. Uh, the identity of and financial interest waiver needs to be signed by the returning party, referring party if applicable. Uh, you're seeing this where other people are kicking this over. Uh, maybe it's a vote counselor. Maybe it's somebody else. Uh, you need an itemize, itemization of the counselor's services to document and substantiate the work the counselor did to support the fee requested. And remember, they're entitled up to $600. They're 10% of the voucher. Uh, that's Labor Code Section 50, sorry, 4658.7E3, uh, the paperwork completed by the counselor for the claimant and uh, the claimant's complete file with their office. Uh, did the counts, one thing to look for is did the counselor help the claimant obtain the $5,000 from the return to work supplemental program? Because uh, there is, this is something that comes up a lot as well is this additional five thousand dollars available from the state uh and this is coming up on the upcoming slides but obviously sometimes the voucher we've all heard rumors whether or not it's true or not uh that the applicant's main concern or the attorney the applicant's attorney's main concern may simply be to obtain that five thousand dollars from the state by obtaining the voucher and then the voucher isn't necessarily cashed in for retraining purposes uh, so look for the documents the school has to submit. Now, if the claimant does not have a high school diploma or GED, uh, they have to pass an ability to benefit test in their primary language. This is important. Uh, there's no point in providing the classes if the, if the claimant's not going to be able to use them. 
So they need to be eligible for this uh, if the school wants to get paid. Uh, the enrollment agreement between the school and the claimant detailing tuition charges should be provided. Uh, you're going to want to double check that against the invoice that you got submitted to if you're the carrier. Uh, purchase invoices are important for computers and miscellaneous equipment associated with uh, the type of retraining they're doing. Uh, look for things like a make and model of the computer, the serial number, uh, the purchase date. Does that match up the type of software? Uh, you're going to want proof that the equipment was delivered to the claimant. Uh, signed acknowledgement they received it, a certified mail slip with a receipt, something like that. Uh, you're going to want to see a timeline for the course completion, and uh, you may want to request the program course catalog. Uh, so with the documentation, uh, if the claimant purchases the equipment themselves, you're going to need to see a receipt for the equipment purchased. Uh, the $500 miscellaneous expense may be used for educational expense. Uh, you want to make sure it doesn't overlap with the items that are being paid for under the enrollment, like various equipment uh, that they may be using under the enrollment. Uh, additional things to consider uh, when you're looking at this, look at the recorded statement, a deposition transcript, the education level of the claimant. Are they able to read and write in English? Um, and answer questions, their employment history, et cetera. Um, what does the CNR language state? Uh, if this is a denied case and the parties get a Beltran finding, for instance, then the voucher is not going to be owed. Um, did we pay for interpreting services is a big one for CNR medical appointments and hearings. If the applicant's unable to take the course in the language, uh, that's certainly going to be a concern. Uh, also, look at the claimant's signature on other claim documents if you're concerned about fraud. Uh, verify against the documents that are received uh, for the voucher program. Uh, important reminders here, no authorization under the label code or CCRs for school to use voucher funds for computer expenses. If the school's selling the computer to the student, they must provide all the documentation that the students are required to present to the carrier. Uh, you're going to want to see receipts for hardware, software, etc. in order to prove this. Uh, control over voucher disbursements is regulated by 8 Cal Code Reg Section 10113.3.1J. The claims administrator shall issue voucher payments to the employee or direct payments to the VRTWC, uh, training providers, and or computer retailer within 45 calendar days. Uh, remember that it's not work days from receipt of the complete uh, voucher, receipts and documentation, or something you're really gonna wanna focus on. Uh, red flags, and obviously this is a big issue. I know we're running short on time. I'll try to run through it quickly. Uh, a lot of represented workers uh, don't get much way in the way of assistance from their attorneys once a case is settled. Uh, the vocational schools and counselors uh, tend to step in. Uh, it seems to be known in various areas that the return to work fund uh, is sometimes used just to pull that $5,000. Uh, I wouldn't support sending out a voucher uh, when the applicant's not entitled just so that they can get an extra $5,000 to help you get the CNR. Uh, you need to have a good faith knowledge that it's owed. Uh, common concerns that something isn't gonna be in the best interest of the claimant is going to include being told they're enrolling in a program for which a school is not approved to provide. So say they're going to be retraining for a uh, machine shop program uh, and they're being enrolled in and they're not certified for that. And they're only sort of that school is only certified for, say, like a florist or something. There's not going to be a relationship there. Um, a concern is the applicant being told that they're just going to receive $500. A free computer in the five thousand uh, dollars, and not notifying them of their actual interest here to to get the retraining. Uh, or concern would be the claimant doesn't have the ability to benefit from the retraining. So if there's a concern about that, you want to make sure that they're actually getting the test. Uh, injured employees are offered retraining benefits. The victims are the students and the insurance carriers. 
Uh, Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, displaced employees are offered retraining benefits, uh, the victims of the students in EDD. Uh, so one thing to look for is when you're concerned about red flags are gonna be schools that are only funded from these vouchers. Uh, there, there does need to be a financial relationship disclosure once again under 550B3. Uh, disclosure does not avoid the pick, kickback violations per Labor Code 3215. Uh, the counselor's fees also do need to be supported by documentation submitted to the claims rep. Uh, it's not enough to just send a bill for $600 as the counselor. You have to actually document what you did. Um, and I believe the, the payment would have to be reasonable for this as well, too. So look at the amount of work done. Uh, as the adjuster, when you're getting these requests, you should be looking at the uh, approval information. Uh, look at the dates. Was the school actually able to offer the program involved at the time? Uh, sometimes we see these where uh, you're getting you're getting dates where the school wasn't actually eligible. Uh, look out for the school's physical address being the same as the owner's residence, uh, especially if it's a residential ownership. That could be a concern. Uh, Sometimes there's a concern that the, the school could be created with the same name and approved, uh, but it's not the actual school. Um, also look out for branches using multiple EINs, uh, DBAs, things like that for payments. Uh, if you have a similar name, uh, you wanna check the tax ID number and make sure it's the same. If they have different locations, make sure you're being billed for the location they went to. Uh, concerns that the school receives the students' names from attorneys, doctor's offices, copier services, translators, and or vocational counseling centers uh, for recruiting. Uh, the concern would be the school sends staff to the students' homes to enroll them and provide them the student, the printer, and computer during the initial visit. They may not actually be attending the program. Uh, also look out for students that are claiming they were enrolled uh, in the attorneys and doctor's offices. That would be something that would trigger a further review. Uh, some students have reported they've never heard of the school or attended the school. Uh, and this is a concern too. Sometimes they're getting this voucher, the carrier's getting this voucher from multiple locations for the same voucher for reimbursement. Um, the counselors can assist the students in receiving the $5,000 from the Department of Industrial uh, Relations. This is something that you might wanna take a little bit of a closer look at if the student tells you this is going on. Um, some things to look for are incomplete, blank, and or uh, multiple of these in the student files, uh, inflated prices, uh, inconsistent uh, documents provided to carriers, students, and in the student files. Uh, if they're missing student signatures, that's a concern. Uh, a big one is no high school diploma or ability to benefit. Uh, or the class, the ATV is in English, but the student only speaks Spanish. Uh, there is a concern these reports can be falsified or the certificates can be falsified. Uh, there's no financial document or records or documents in the student files, no attendance records, no grades or transcripts, um, copy and pasted signatures. Um, things to look out for as well. They're not approved for distance education. They're not approved for instruction in the student's home. Uh, once again, go ahead and verify in the BP. PE licensing file that the classes being offered are the ones being provided and that they're legally able to offer those. Um, another thing to look out for is the instructor or faculty have a criminal record. Uh, if you don't have attendance records for the injured worker actually attending the school. Uh, a big one, and this is one you gotta look out for, is they don't speak English and the school isn't approved for Spanish programs. Um, the instruction can be on campus, in the student's home and online, but uh, you wanna make sure they're actually benefiting from this program. Uh, look out for approval for unrelated program, cake decorating to mechanics, uh, and the campus doesn't support that kind of program. That would be a concern, right? Make sure that this campus they're at is actually offering the classes that are claimed. Um, 
there's a concern that students may not be truthful uh, if they're concerned that they may be the ones investigated. So it's important to look at the paperwork. Uh, yeah, student expenses. Uh, the schools are allowed to issue students computers and printers. That's not a violation. Uh, but they do need to document what they're providing and you need the receipts for that. The schools are allowed to issue the students the $500 for educational expenses. Uh, falsified computer purchase receipts are a concern. Uh, computers, uh, if the computer doesn't support the operating system that's provided to the student, then that would be a concern. Like the students enrolled in iOS, however they get an HP computer, uh, they're not gonna be able to run the operating system. So uh, looks like we're running out of time. So I would just say, Essentially what you're looking for, these are all ideas about various inconsistencies between what's claimed and what's offered. Um, once again, the voucher program is strictly controlled on the disbursements. Uh, we've got the voucher fraud checklist. Uh, concerns. Oh, liens are stayed. Uh, as I'm sure you guys are aware, if you haven't been, check out the press release that I have listed here. Uh, Laura Wilson and Hazel Ortega are now on the 4615 stay list. Uh, there's a list of the various other people involved in that press release. And if you see any of those names, make sure to double check the BPPE uh, and the eligibility requirements. Uh, continue to check in on the stay of liens. Uh, like I said, if you see anybody involved in there and any of those names are coming up, then double check all your paperwork. Uh, fee payments to council up to $600, uh, but it has to be reasonable. Uh, there's the attachments. And yeah, if, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, that is our presentation for the day. Thank you both very much. And we really appreciate you taking the time to present today and all of you for attending. I have some quick closing items. You can register for our October 23rd webinar with Nasser Adil on recent trends in workers' compensation defense. Um, you can register for that now on our website, on our training page at bradfordbarthel.com. As always, we appreciate you joining, and we look forward to seeing you next month. Take care, everybody.